I want to, to give a message to the online attendants. Uh, so uh, as you see, you can t make questions, raise hand, but please, when you make a question, ask it in the chat and to everyone. So don't send a private message to Andrea or to Sarah, just uh, send a chat to everyone so we can see it and, and, and make the question to the speaker, okay? So, okay, with more, no more delays, uh, I introduce uh, Thomas Franz uh, from Innsbruck. Okay, so I think I have the microphone here. I hope this works. Okay, excellent. So first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for um, putting up this meeting here in Trieste. I'm very happy to, to be here. Uh, it's a very long time that I haven't been to Trieste. Um, so great, uh, for, thanks for, for inviting me. Um, so the conference is on, on non-Markovian um, dynamics in non-equilibrium setups. And this brought me actually in, into a little trouble since I have several research topics um, uh, that show, so, okay. huh? no, I forgot what to do. Maybe it works, or maybe it's trying on. Okay, now it should work again. Okay, thank you. So I have several research topics that I developed over the years. Many of them show nice facets of non-trivial Markovian dynamics. For example, here this uh, topic on cellular crowding and porous media that's connected to the percolation transition There you have really persistent memory for, for very, very long times. But in a sense, it's equilibrium dynamics. Um, then I have a long history on the glass transition, which is kind of the paradigm where you have a memory that uh, memory effects that separate from from the microdynamics over orders of magnitude. But still, the theory that we are using is an equilibrium theory. So that's also not not uh, non-equilibrium. There's needles and biofilaments where um, where nice um, simulations have been performed and compared to theoretical predictions of Doi and Edwards, but also this is, um, this is equilibrium dynamics. Um, we also did this for active needles, so this is the non-equilibrium, but in a sense there are no interesting non-Markovian effects, and the basic equations are all Markovian. Then we have something on intercellular sun, uh, transport that could be classified as uh, non-equilibrium, but also not real strong memory effects. And last, self-propelled particles, the active particles, but there we start from sim simple Langevin equations, there's also no memory. So the topic that I eventually picked is this um, on, on a, a dilute uh, suspension that we drive out of equilibrium. And in this, um, before, uh, yeah, before I actually start, I should make a remark on non-Markovian effects. So we learned yesterday from Leticia, uh, she quoted uh, uh, from Van Kampen that, yeah, the, um, most effects in physics are non-Markovian. Well, actually, there's a different viewpoint. So, um, so uh, there's a different viewpoint, namely in physics, we usually start on with Newtonian equation or Langevin equations, where you have no memory so whatsoever. And the memory or the non-Markovian effects appear once you start coarse graining, as we have seen. So on a fundamental level, there is no memory. Only once you start coarse graining, there's memory. This doesn't work on, or, or only in physics. Actually, this works quite generally. So for any stochastic process, you can do a simple trick. Namely, you just extend the, phase, uh, the state space in such a way that your state contains the entire history. So if you do that, and that's perfectly legitimate, I talked to a mathematician to do that, that's perfectly, so any non-Markovian process can be turned in a trivial way to a Markovian process. Unfortunately, this is purely formal and doesn't help you to solve any problem. Yeah? So, so this is just a matter then of, um, of notation. Anyway, so let me start my talk with a kinetic theory of a, a paradigmatic model, namely hard spheres. And this uh, model is kind of the origin when uh, non-Markovian effects have been introduced. So the model is very simple. So you just have a, a hard sphere flu fluid, so it's Newtonian dynamics. Um, the interaction is maximally simple, so you just have the exclusion um, uh, principle that two spheres cannot overlap. And since this is so simple, there's only one structural control parameter, which is the packing fraction that is the 
a fraction of the volume taken relative to the uh, f uh, uh, available volume. So then people, then uh, this is considered to be ballistic dynamics with specular scattering. Energy conservation holds, momentum conservation holds. Um, and the simplest quantity that you can look at is the self-dynamics of uh, a single tracer. And this has been done by computer simulations by Alder and Wainwright many, many years ago. So they looked at the mean square displacement of a single particle uh, and derived the velocity autocorrelation function as the second derivative of this. And they found, here are the original data. I don't know if the pointer, no, this pointer does not work. So on the right-hand side, so you see the original data of Alder and Wainwright. And contrary to the expectations of these times that this velocity autocorrelation function should decay exponentially, basically in a, a memoryless fashion, they found a, a power law tail. So the velocity autocorrelation function in this system decays only like a power law. And this, this means now that there are really strong memory effects because even after coarse graining, you don't get rid of the memory. So even if you zoom out in the time scale, you still have a power law because this power law is, uh, is um, scale free. So it doesn't help you to zoom out, only you decrease the amplitude. How did they explain this? So they said, okay, so, um, so sorry, I shouldn't start an argument with okay, because if you do that, then there's always there's something fishy. So here's <laughs> nothing fishy about that, so there's no, no introduction. So they said, it's true that um, the momentum is not conserved of, of a single particle, but this doesn't mean that the surrounding fluid can just eat up the momentum. It can take it away and slowly transport it away, but the momentum cannot disappear. Yeah, so there's no beaming of momentum or something like that. Which means the picture is the following. So you start your particle with some initial momentum or velocity, and after some time, this momentum is redistributed to a sphere of surrounding particles. So the, uh, so the, um, uh, the velocity autocorrelation should uh, be something like one over the volume of the sphere. So that's the memory that's in the system. And since uh, momentum conservation is uh, governed by the Navier-Stokes equation, or by the Stokes equations in this case, uh, for slow, low Reynolds number, then you uh, anticipate, well, the Stokes equation looks similar to a diffusion equation, so this radius should grow only diffusively. That is like square root over t, uh, of t. And indeed, this is the correct argument. So the velocity of autocorrelation function decays like one over r cubed. That is one over t to the, oh, t to the minus three over two. So this is the correct argument. And um, you can even work out the, the prefactors, at least for a colloidal system. So this is a paradigm that I want to use for, uh, for this uh, memory effects. This is equilibrium dynamics. Let me spend some time for, on equilibrium dynamics before we go to the true non-equilibrium case. So the question is now, what happens if you do Brownian dynamics rather than Newtonian dynamics? Yeah? And with Brownian dynamics, I mean that I discard any hydrodynamic interaction um, so the particles just undergo individual Brownian dynamics and from time to time they collide. And you can study this, say, with event-driven Brownian dynamics. Um, then you expect that, at, well, at short times where the particles don't see each other, you just see the uh, diffusion coefficient of the Brownian dynamics that you put in. But at long times, again, you will see diffusive dynamics, but the diffusion coefficient will be slower than the one that you put in due to the interaction with the other particles. So, sorry, yeah? will just collide, uh, they will just bounce back uh, elastically. Um, well, uh, the, if you're asking about the algorithm, this is how we do that. Yeah? So in the, in, uh, you can write down the, um, the uh, Smolokhovsky equation, many body Smolokhovsky equation, where you just have a boundary conditions. If you want to call this a collision or not, this is up to you. Yeah? Um, so anyway, um, there is a prediction from the, uh, which is now 40 years old from, um, uh, from Hannah and Hess and, and uh, similar people did this later that they said that the velocity co correlation function in this case should also display an algebraic long time tail, although the, the exponent is different now. So there's no momentum conservation. There's only particle number conservation, but here also persistent correlation should appear due to repeated collisions with the same particles. 
So the exponent is different and actually the sign is different. So whereas in the momentum conserving case, the uh, velocity articulation function gets a push. So here it's strictly anti-correlated. And this prediction has, can, has been kind of forgotten for, for many, many, many years. And the reason is um, this is why well, I call this the simulator's nightmare because this is a prediction that is made for low density. So the, the velocity articulation function here should be proportional to the uh, packing fraction. But you see at low density, the particle basically just do random motion. So you have a huge noise, and under this huge noise, there's only a tiny, tiny small signal buried that shows this, this, uh, this um, persistent anti-correlations. Okay, so here on the right hand, you can see a figure of the mean square displacement. So you see initially for different packing fractions, both on logarithmic time scales. So you see at short times, you see the Bayer diffusion where the particles don't see each other. And at long times, you see that in, in, upon increasing the packing fraction, uh, uh, diffusion slows down. But the prediction is that underneath, so if you take second derivatives, there should be this long time tail. Okay. Um, let, let me dive into the prediction of, Agatha, of Hannah and Hess. So what they did is the prediction is for low density. And for low density, the problem simplifies a lot because you have to solve only for the dynamics of two particles. Yeah? And then you can basically upgrade this. So you have to solve the, uh, the motion of two particles only. And this they could do. So they derived actually the full propagator. But I focus here on the velocity or autocorrelation function. And I show it to you in the frequency domain. So then you see the first term. The first term d is just a constant in the frequency domain, which means Brownian uh, without interaction. Just, you just have white noise. Yeah? So there's no frequency dependent whatsoever. The next term is proportional to phi, the packing fraction, by construction. Yeah? So by construction, this is what they calculated. And the next term, phi squared, we don't know anything about it because there you need more than two particles. And what you can see is now that due to the interaction, this becomes frequency dependent. So there is memory in the system. But it's more exciting than that because the frequency dependence is peculiar. It uh, shows the square root of the frequency which means that the frequency dependence is non-analytic. Yeah? So it's a non-analytic function in the frequency. And now you can basically uh, do the back transform. You can do it in the, for all times, but interest, more interesting is, are just long times. So if you go back in, in the temporal domain, you see that the velocity autocorrelation function is this t, phi, uh, over, uh, t to the minus five, uh, phi, 5 over 2 with some prefactor. Um, I wrote this in this form that I have a B of phi. Uh, we will see that this prediction of this long time tail persists actually to all densities and is not confined to low density. And the interpretation is that, that we have this algebraic memory. So again, this does not fade out upon coarse graining because it's self-similar. So there are strong memory effects. And the interpretation is basically that the particle remembers um, that it's uh, where, where it already collided with another particle. Okay, um, so I have a long story in these long time tales. So, um, uh, so we touch these in the so-called Lorentz model. So in the Lorentz model, you basically have one tracer particle that explores a disordered array of particles. And it is known already in the late 1960s that for the Lorentz model, uh, tales like this appear. But actually, this was for prediction was for ballistic dynamics, and the calculation is horrible. So it's 40 pages long, and I never really uh, followed the entire uh, argument. For Brownian dynamics, so and the problem is that for ballistic dynamics, even if you treat the two-body problem, um, this is not good enough because in, in ballistic dynamics, once you scatter, you never come back. So you need kind of to solve uh, the simplest way, namely the Boltzmann equation for your particle to come back. So this is already difficult. In Brownian dynamics, it's much easier. And so we decided to do Brownian dynamics in the Lorentz model. And we indeed found these uh, predicted tails. Um, and what my PhD student at the time did is she divided also by the density. So note the densities are not low here. Nevertheless, she found that there's data collapse. 
And I said, wow, this is great. If you find data collapse, this means that I need to calculate this expression only to lowest order in the density, and this is something that I can do. So uh, in two times, this is in two dimensions, so the exponent of the tail is different, but everything can be worked out. Okay, um, now um, only recently we came back then to this full problem where all particles moved, move, so this dilo uh, di dilute colloidal suspension, and my uh, collaborator, my uh, former um, postdoc, managed to generate data and s look at the quality here. Yeah? So we have something like orders of magnitude in the velocity autocollation function, which is already, already buried uh, below the Brownian noise. And we also divide it by the packing fraction. So the packing fraction here um, varies by a factor of 10. So if you if you take this into account, you even have one, one decade more. Yeah? And what he sees is indeed that, um, that for all density, you get, you get this power law tail. For the lowest density, the black curve here is just a theory of uh, Hannah and Hess. This, um, uh, this fits perfectly to the theory. Um, um, the amplitude of this tail now depends sensitively on the density, and there's no theoretical prediction, at least not in, within the Sana and Hess theory to first order in the density. There's a peculiarity, namely that also at short times you have a power law tail. This has something to do with um, which I call the skin effect, so there's also a non-analytic dependence of the skin depth on the frequency here, and it's, that's the origin of that. Okay, so how how did he actually do that? Yeah? So how did he do that? I told you, basically, you have only noise at low densities. And the idea was the following. So we developed a, a, a noise suppression algorithm. And the idea was the following. So when you simulate, you draw random numbers for your noise. And the idea was to use this, the very same noise history to generate two trajectories rather than one. So in the one trajectory, this is where all spheres are interacting, just like we want. They collide from time to time. And we generate a second uh, trajectory where the spheres just go through each other, so they don't see each other. And then we take the difference between these two, and I gen generate a generally interaction-induced part. And since our system is dilute, um, most of the time, they just will go in parallel which means that this delta R, this, uh, this interaction-induced part, will just remain constant most of the time. And every time there's a collision, something will happen. And then you can just rearrange and say, so basically what, what you do is you put, um, you put uh, this, hmm, you put delta R0 to the left and this small delta R to the right and then square and take averages then you find, well, this delta R0 squared on average, this we know because this is Brownian motion. This is just 60, 0, T. So we have three non-trivial terms. And after rearranging the one on the left-hand side, this is the one that we want. Then we have the, the interaction-induced term by itself. And we have a cross term. And what Suvendo Mandal did is he plotted each of these three terms. So here is the bare, the bare noise term. And then you already see that this, uh, the term uh, of the noise-induced uh, correlation is by orders of uh, magnitude um, smaller. So where is it? This one is, um, this one is uh, the term that is smaller by orders of magnitude. So this is a signal that is non-trivial. And uh, the cross-correlation term is again smaller by, by orders of magnitude. So this led to the suggestion that this cross-correlation term actually is exactly zero. And we have some toy models where we could show that, for, indeed, for height interaction, this should be zero. And if this is true, then you can just calculate the velocity autocollation function by looking only at the noise, in, uh, at the interaction-induced part, because on taking second derivatives, you get rid of the noise term here, the bare noise. Yeah? And by doing this, he could generate this velocity autocollation function. This is not confined to hard spheres, so you can do this also for soft spheres. So re he reproduced everything for soft spheres. And indeed, you find this a long time tail, uh, similar density dependence. But this feature that you have, this, uh, also this short time tail, this is lost in for, for soft interactions. OK. Um, OK. Um, so I told you there's no theory for um, beyond Hannah and Hess. This is not really true. So I come from the mode coupling theory of the glass transition. 
Um, and I don't have time to explain that theory here, so this has been developed by my PhD advisor, Wolfgang Götz, Götze, who passed away only last year. So there the theory um, focuses on the intermediate scattering function of collective density fluctuations um, by the projection operator of Zwanzig and Mori. You can derive exact relations between this quantity and, oh, there's a typo here actually, and, uh, and so-called memory kernels. And the question is, of course, then what is the memory kernel? So in a sense, this is empty, unless you have some physical intuition to model this memory kernel. Here the idea is, so I put a picture here on the right, which is probably my most important contribution to science, since this picture has been copied many, many times. I did this when I was a PhD student. So you see here this red particle is kind of trapped by the surrounding particles. This is called a cage. And the Zwanzig Mori tells you that this memory function is essentially stress relaxation. But you see by this picture, stresses can only relax when particle relax. So there is kind of a feedback mechanism. And that motivated this idea to write the memory kernel as a functional of the, of the density correlation function itself. And that gave very nice predictions for the class transition. Uh, the non-trivial prediction that has been tested in experiments and so on. So this is a very successful theory, which I think it's fair to say is still the basis for theoretical development even some 30 years later. Anyway, this theory also makes a prediction for the velocity autocorrelation function if you do this for Brownian dynamics. And indeed, it gives the correct, uh, correct power law, it's also anti-correlated, it's anti-persistent, but it makes a prediction for the density dependence. And in these two figures I show again, right are the simulation data, and to the left are this mode coupling theory prediction, and you see on a qualitative level this all works. It also say, uh, predicts a strong density dependence here. The density dependence in mode coupling theory is stronger, significantly stronger than in the simulations as you can see here by this prefactor. So this covers more decades than the left-hand side. It was a technical challenge to actually implement this um, because you have to resolve long wavelength fluctuations, which we usually don't do in mode coupling theory. So that was not easy, but we managed to do that. And then we see, we can explain now the, the effect of the density depends due to two things. So one is that, um, so you see that, um, uh, that the diffusion coefficient itself slows down. So that's, that's encoded in the prefactor. But more importantly, it's the, the compressibility of the system. So the structure factor um, depends or significantly on, on density at the long wavelengths. So the compressibility of the system plays an important role, as is highlighted here in this red formula. OK, so we were very happy that basically, um, well, actually, I can tell you that long time tails and glass transition this was the topic of my PhD uh, thesis. I kind of managed to bring up a theory that uh, does both, but only many years later we managed to do that, which is basic, maybe that's probably the question that my PhD advisor really had in mind. Can you build a theory that has, has both? And this is now the result here. Okay, let me make this resume for this equilibrium part. So we have this Brownian dynamic simulation, we found the tail, and have an explanation for, for the amplitude. Uh, within mode coupling theory, um, we reproduce qualitatively the density dependence and have an explanation for this in terms of the compressibility and the slowing down of transport. So now let me go one step further. So yesterday, um, we learned already about microrheology. There are different ways to do that. Um, so you trap a particle. Uh, and look either at the fluctuation or you pull on the particle actively. This has become quite popular in the early 2000s. So people basically trap a particle and pull at it or look at just look at the fluctuation. The idea was you measure kind of the frequency dependent diffusion coefficient and connect it to the frequency dependent viscosity, so a material parameter in terms of the so-called generalized Stokes-Einstein relation, which is not really true, but approximately. Um, so you can measure on a microscopic scale um, rheological properties. That's why it's called uh, microrheology. So 
coming back to our colloidal solution, what I do want to do now is I want to drive this out of equilibrium. And again, so and here I really confine this to low density. Yeah? So low density. So the setup is the following. So we start in equilibrium. And at a certain time, I start pulling with a, uh, uh, with a strong force on one particle. So I drive the system out of equilibrium, as shown here in this, in this sketch. Yeah? So the force is constant throughout. And the question that I want to answer is, so there will be a steady state at long times. So the particle will move on, uh, with a constant velocity, so or average diff velocity. And I'm also asking, so I'm asking, how do you approach the stationary state? And um, uh, so, so what is the time-dependent drift velocity? And later I will also ask about the fluctuations. Why is this question interesting? Well, we learned earlier that, well, by the fluctuation dissipation theorem to linear response, the velocity, that is the deterministic response, is encoded just in the velocity autocorrelation function. Yeah, so this is linear response. And um, by taking this formula, you can uh, make special cases. For example, you go to infinite time, then you see, okay, linear response is just the, the mobility, is just the diffusion over KBT. So that's the linear response coefficient that has been predicted by Einstein. And the diffusion coefficient is then just given by the green kubo relation. Um, it's interesting if you now look, uh, so the linear response prediction is interesting for the time dependence because we said that this velocity autocorrelation function displays power loss. So also this long linear response should, um, so you should basically approach the long time limit only algebraically. That is, there are long time persistent memories in this. So this is what linear response says. Okay, oops. What is also known is on for the stationary velocity. So there's a um, paper by Squires and Brady who looked at the stationary case. So you pull hard at this one particle and they defined uh, a mobility that depends on the force. So unfortunately, the, the pointer doesn't work. Uh, so the velocity, I write the velocity in the stationary case as a mobility times the force. Okay. Yeah, mobility times the force, and the mobility depends now on the force itself. It's made here in this dimensional fashion, and it's called then a Pickley number. There are several cases that are familiar. So if you do linear response, that is in Pickley number zero, and say at infinite dilution, the mobility is just the Stokes mobility. And it has been worked out many, many years at the beginning of the 20th century, what is the first order density correction of this linear response coefficient? So that's the base, essentially the suppression of diffusion due to packing. And Squires and Brady worked out the stationary mobility uh, for, uh, as a power series of the Pickley number. So you see for Pickley zero, it reproduces this well-known result, but they have corrections then to the mobility in powers of the Pickley number. And what I did is uh, I wrote their formula a little bit different. I put here absolute magnitudes to highlight that the signal, the result should not depend whether you pull or to the right or to the left. But now you see this is now a non-analytic function here in the Pickley number. So the, so the figure of merit, so this response curve is non-analytic in the driving. So the questions that I want to ask is now, where does this non-analytic contribution come from? Second, how do you do numerics? Because if you blindly plot this asymptotic series, you see the radius of conversion is at about one. Whereas um, if you do the numeric correctly, then you can go to arbitrarily high Pickley numbers. The simulation is here compared for liquids, so they were tru truly all particles move. But you can do it also for a Lorentz model where only one particle moves to lowest order in the density, this doesn't really matter because you have to consider only a single pair and then you put yourself in the center of mass or whatever. Okay, so where do these non-analytic contributions come from? Oops. Okay, so again, to lowest order in the density, we have to look at the two particles Smolochowski equation. And I show the equation directly here for the relative motion of this, uh, of this pair. 
the different terms that show up is, uh, is a diffusive term, a diffusive term here, and here's the relative diffusion. If everybody moves, the relative diffusion is just oh, twice. You, you take it backwards? Um, it works on, on R. It so takes R on R. No, R prime is the initial condition. So this is the this is the forward. So it's not the it's a Fokker Planck equation if you want. There right? should be another way around, right? No, we are acting really on No, I mean the, 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 you should have a divergence of the force times the twice, right? Where the force is constant. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the that that's true. So the force is constant, yeah. So the force is constant, you can write this either way. Okay. So this is this term here says now this is the relative diffusion of the pair. And the force basically wants to tear the pair apart. So we start our system in equilibrium. That is, everything is allowed except overlap. So the minimal distance is just a, a sigma. Then you have some no flux boundary conditions, so the particles cannot penetrate each other. And what we are interested in is, say, the generating functions of the displacement, relative displacements, which you can get by integrating the solution. So there are some technical details that I'm don't want to go too much in, into. The point is, um, if you, you can, if you go in, in the Fourier domain and make some tricks, this equation here looks like this. And there's a nice trick that has been uh, introduced by Brady and Squires. They say, let's make something like, I call this a gauge transformation. So if you factor this thing out and concentrate on the residual, you get a very easy equation, which is just the Helmholtz equation. So the Helmholtz equation can be solved in, well, okay, there's a price to it. This parameter kappa now depends on both frequency and the force that is on the Peccet number. And then you can solve this equation in full beauty for, for uh, with some undetermined coefficients in terms of this um, uh, spherical Bessel function, blah, blah, blah. Um, these are just Legendre polynomials. And what you need to determine is these unknown constants here. And although this equation is simple, the boundary condition is not. So now you kind of couple different angular channels, but it's not spectacular. So you just get a tri-diagonal tri matrix for these unknown coefficients. And you see in particular if the Peckley number is zero, that is in equilibrium, this matrix is diagonal and you get the solution immediately. So you can do now a perturbative scheme and so on and calculate everything in particular uh, the propagator in terms of self-energy, so this is all not really interesting. At the end, we have a formal expression of the mobility as a function of the frequency and the force as a series expansion in terms of these coefficients that we determined. So, fine. So what you find out now is that this expression has only even powers in the Peckley number, as it should, so it doesn't matter if you pull to the right or to the left. Um, and there's no reason to believe that this RL is a non-analytic function of, uh, 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 as the result of the equation. So at the end you ask, where do the non-analytic uh, terms come from? Well, let's have a look back at our complex wave number uh, due to this gauge transformation. Now I put explicitly the square root. So you see this kappa sigma encodes two things, namely the frequency and the driving. And you can do now two things. Uh, this function is, of course, perfectly smooth, except if the argument becomes zero. And this happens precisely at two cases. Namely, you can put now the frequency equal to zero, and then you see here we have the absolute magnitude of the Peckley number. And this is actually the case that reproduces Squires and Brady. So here, they are the non-analytic driving in the, in the um, response curve. If you put the driving to zero, you get the square root of a frequency, which gives the long time tails as before. So you see the long time tails and this non-analytic driving are kind of two sides of, of the same coin. Yeah? And this, I think, is a really beautiful result. And maybe in this sense, it fits nicely into this workshop. So we have really true non-equilibrium system with non-analytic everything. And we have true memory effects here. And actually, uh, we solved this earlier for, for a similar system on a lattice, where you can work out um, everything analytic without perturbation theory. You can solve for, for everything. OK, so let me just show what, what happens here. So there's a pile up of, of probability. So once you start uh, pulling on the particle, there will be um, probability uh, particles will pile up in front. 
and they will be depleted behind. This happens both in simulation as well as in our analytic solution. Okay, let, this I want to show you, but then I stop. So now you can ask, so I said, we, how do you approach the steady state? So you said in equilibrium, in the equilibrium or linear response, you expect that this should be a power law. And here you see now this, um, whenever you do a driving, a non-trivial driving, then you follow this power law for some time, but then uh, you deviate from it, so this power law is cut off and you have an exponential approach to the true state. And actually there's also a sign change for which I don't have an explanation. Yeah? So what you see is now, and this is really fascinating, that uh, an, uh, there's a divergent time scale emerging that separates two regimes. So one is an intrinsic linear response regime. So up to a time, so t tau is the natural time scale of a problem and Peckley, so if Peckley becomes small, this diverges. So if you are below this time scale, essentially you, re you recover this linear response prediction. So essentially you follow this tail here. But there's a second regime, so if you go at larger time scale, you drive your system to a true non-equilibrium state. And these are separated by this, by this div diverging time scale. And this actually makes a lot of sense because you smoothly connect now non-equilibrium steady state with an equilibrium relaxation uh, uh, in the system. Okay, so this is, I think, one of the major findings also of this project. Okay, so um, I have more on fluctuations, so you can calculate not only the mean motion, but also the fluctuations around this, this I skip. And go directly here to these conclusions. So what we worked out is the response to a step force, and we were able to, uh, to calculate completely this time-dependent mobility to lowest order in the density for all Peckley numbers, that is for all forces and for all times. Um, and the major finding is it's non-analytic in, in the frequency and in the driving. Um, if you have any finite driving, then, then this long time anomaly will disappear. So, so, this, so basically linear response is wrong at this long times, even for arbitrarily small forces. Yeah, so that's qualitatively wrong. And the origin is again that you have this uh, repeated in, uh, encounter with particles. You can do everything on the lattice uh, where you can work out everything, not only the velocity autocollation function, uh, and we found similar uh, things on the lattice here. What we want to do next, there's a proposal pending, we want to extend this for the viscosity, so rather than pulling out a single particle, we want to shear the suspension. This is way more difficult um, because my nice trick with this gauge transformation doesn't really work anymore. Yeah? So, um, yeah, and that's, so what, what is really fascinating, what I would like to do, I know, don't know if this is possible. So um, I would like to know, are there some general mathematical constraints on correlation or response functions even beyond equilibrium? So we know in equilibrium, uh, there are correlation functions and there's rather strict restriction how a correlation function lo should look. Uh, so basically, if I draw a function on, at the blackboard and I ask, is this a correlation function or not, you can give the very easy answer. Take the Fourier transform, the cosine Fourier transform, this has to be positive. If this is not positive, then this is absurd. Yeah? And the question is, is there anything similar to that even beyond equilibrium? That would be really nice. And and for this particular system, it would be nice kind of to have a marriage between mode coupling theory and, um, and these low density expansions, so kind of to extend this to arbitrary high density. Thank you very much. This is what I wanted to tell you today. Thank you very much for a nice talk. Uh, so I give the voice to questions. And I'd like to emphasize that there has been almost no questions from students, so uh, I encourage them to ask questions and I give you the voice first. So if there's any student with a question, please, it's your chance. Nobody? Okay, I think that we didn't have conference in two years in person. So <laughs> it's a good chance, okay. No questions, also online? Well, either to everything is clear or it's too difficult. <laughs> Thanks, Thomas. Very nice talk. 
So I, I know you, are, you did not yet do that, but since you already announced that you plan to do that, what do you expect in terms of these constraints uh, on the response function out of equilibrium? Because I mean, typically, you know, the stuff that constrains the mathematical properties of response function in equilibrium, it's, it's very intuitive. Right? Yeah. Now what can happen most likely that the time dependence will not be monotonic. Yeah. So what are, what are you expecting that well, this could be? So far we are just collecting fingerprints of true non-equilibrium behavior. So what can actually happen is that, so for this colloidal system uh, in equilibrium, all correlation functions should be completely monotone functions. That is not only yeah. the decay is monotone, but, but also the I derivative know. decays monotonely and the secondary, blah, 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 blah. And this is clearly violated. Yeah? So, so here we see fingerprints that this is, these functions are no longer completely monotone functions. Um, on the frequency dependence, I don't know if you can manage to have a spectral density that becomes negative. This I don't really know. No, I mean in that the time dependence, not the spectral density, not. Mm -hmm. I don't dare not. But I think you know that if you would have a non, so non-monotonic response in time, so yeah. oscillations, but yeah. strictly positive. That happens, yeah. Uh, so then, what what you what you may wish for, right? It's, I have no idea if it happens that there is a there is a bound on the on the ratio of the imaginary and real parts of the of the eigenmodes, mm -hmm. or the eigenvalues yeah. that actually enter there, right? For example. That, that could uh, be. Yeah. Because this is, I mean, this, this one would expect from algebra, mm -hmm. right, in terms of what typically happens. Yeah. It's just that this system is a manifold system, so. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very ambitious yeah. so, project. So this is a long time goal, and I don't have any, any clue how to do that. Yeah. Well, impressive, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my question might be very trivial, but uh, it goes back to the first part of the talk uh, when you were talking about the role of momentum conservation in the hard sphere models. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is, like, it, it seems like imposing like, a conservation or symmetry affects like, and, 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 and like, causes like, memory effects to yeah. arise. Mm -hmm. So of course, maybe it's not precisely momentum conservation, as you said, like if you replace it with like number, like particle number conservation, yeah. you still have this effect. Yeah. But like my, my question was like, do you have any intuition on how like memory effects and these tails are affected by removing like perfect momentum conservation, for example, like allowing like some like small non-conservation or something like that? Well, I guess then you end up similar to this, that uh, they say you will see persistent correlations for some time, but at the end they will just get destroyed. Okay. This, and depending how you play with the parameter, so there should be a cr smooth crossover. And yeah, so, but you see, this is what any com computer simulant would tell you anyway. So yeah, I have a finite box. And of course, if I run my simulation too long, you will see artifacts of the box size. So you have to be, make sure that you are in the window where you actually I uh, want the physics to see. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Other questions? There's one online. Um, it's asking, uh, for driving a single particle in a static potential landscape, do you expect that the same non-analyticity in the number shows yes. up? Yes, uh, this is, um, well, um, so we did this for, so on the level of lowest order in the density, it doesn't matter if all particles move or one tracer because the, so you can, as in classical mechanics, you just put yourself in the center of mass or center of diffusion in this case, and you have the same equation. Yeah? So what happens is, so there are differences at higher orders in the density because if, um, at higher order density, what can happen is that you have clusters and then your particle bumps into that, such a cluster and it will take a very long time to get out. Yeah? So, so it's already at the sing hitting a single particle, it takes a long time to kind of rub around that particle. But when, if you, once you have particles that kind of build a, a shape like that, a wedge shape, this will take excessively long. And, all, and this will happen at any density. So it's even more interesting in that sense. So there's a prediction by the mathematicians that say, well, um, uh, I looked at the I looked at at the limit basically density going to zero, and then you can do what with the force whatever you like. 
The mathematicians also consider the opposite limit where they say, well, I have a small but finite density uh, and I have some force and then let the density go to zero. And then very strange things happen, so the system can fall out of equilibrium if you really pull hard enough. Um, so there's a hierarchy of time scales where basically particles um, bump into clusters. So I threw out all clusters from the very beginning in the calculation because I consider only first order in density. But there are these, all these limits are not commuting. So, so in, in literature you find, sometimes find, okay, these long time tails uh, by Alder and Wayne, right, they have, uh, 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 they have an extension which is called Dorfmann's lemma that says all transport coefficients are non-analytic functions of all quantities, frequency, wave number, density, in, at least in kinetic case I showed you here in the external driving. So basically this linear response point that we are typically looking is, is the most fragile of all. Right? <laughs> okay. Uh, no, just one, one question, otherwise. Uh, yeah. So, so you looked at just one single tracer, right? So, so now imagine that you put two tracers, okay? Would there be an effective interaction mediated by the surrounding fluid? Well, you see, this, the, the simulations are for uh, in a dilute suspension. And qualitatively, everything um, is, is the same. Uh, I cannot do the calculation for more than, than a pair. So the simulation corroborate that the scenario remains the same, at least for reasonable forces. If you pull really, really hard and you have a Lorentz system where p particles are frozen, then you will fall out of equilibrium at very large times. Yeah, that's, that is kind of the, the picture. So, so it, it's, not, it's not that these things happen only to lowest order in density. Uh, you can go to higher densities and even more interesting things happen if you pull really, really hard. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's thank Thomas again for the great talk. Yeah.